Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Does morality matter anymore? Did it matter ever in American politics? Let's get to the bottom line. Since Election Day a few weeks ago, many American politicians have been talking about the need for the nation to heal. But the rift between people inside America is really deep, and there's frustration on both sides of that divide. Those who voted for Donald Trump and everything he stands for are wondering who's going to stand up for them now. And millions of voters on the Democratic side feel their hopes and aspirations could be dashed as well. Trump once told writer Bob Woodward that he wanted to bring out the rage in people. So are Americans doomed to be motivated and divided by fear and anger? And is there a way to really heal the nation? Today we speak with one of the most unique voices in American public life. Reverend William Barber II is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, a social justice movement that mobilizes the poor to be agents of social change. Reverend Barber, it's great to be with you today. What I'm hoping to get at in the important work that you are doing is the question of what that common ground could be as you think about healing the breach and addressing at the same time many of the core problems of the nation, what does that agenda look like? Well, Steve, uh, first of all, thank you so much. And what is so interesting about that question that you just raised is that we actually have answers. Answers that are ancient as our Bible, uh, answers that are as old as our Constitution, uh, and our deepest religious values. But the problem is, one of the first problem is, we begin all of our conversations, uh, I think, with two mythologies that constantly keep us in uh, division, maybe even three uh, in light of what Trump, you just quoted from Trump. One is the mythology that there is some grand place behind us, behind us, where everybody was unified. It is interesting to me that the Constitution begins with a confession that the reason we're writing the Constitution is to move towards a more perfect union, which is an admittance that we were not perfect behind us. It calls us to look forward and to look backward only to do, as one of our great hymns says, to mend our every flaws. Uh, but instead, sometimes in politics, we start first talking about how to get back to these glorious days of American exceptionalism. And I think that is that is dangerous. The second mythology that I think is this notion of, of, of language of left versus right. And now we say left, right, and centrist. I often wonder where does that language come from? Now, I know historically it comes from the French Revolution. Those on the left were against the monarchy. Those on the right were for the monarchy. I guess those in the center were for a mixture, but we're not in the French Revolution. And to automatically try to put people in these false categories, left and right and, and center, actually, I think, creates division, but also um, many times uh, doesn't allow us to say some things are not left versus right, they're right versus wrong. And if we look at our deepest uh, moral and constitutional foundations, we have to be able to say some things are wrong, are unconstitution, are morally um, uh, unacceptable, and are economically insane, and are constitutionally out of line. We have to be able to do that. Otherwise, we end up giving equal moral status. The, the third thing, I think, in the midst of, 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 of Trumpism that we have to deal with is the danger of putting all of the problems we're seeing now on him. Now, he is a big cause, but he had a lot of enablers. And just like you said in your opening, when he said he wanted to bring out the rage, he's not even quoting himself. He's quoting Pat Buchanan and Kevin Phillips and the people who worked with Richard Nixon in the 1960s to develop a strategy called positive polarization that, is, that has been, that was in, designed to split the country for political uh, power. And it's been used by Republicans from Reagan to, 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 to Nixon to um, uh, even George the Bushes used it. And, and many of the politicians in the South. So we have to at least have some honest conversation first if we're going to have serious healing. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, only the truth will set you free. 
And we've got some truth telling that must be done in America so that we can at least have honest conversation about what healing needs to take place. Like you, President-elect Biden is not talking about left and right. He's not talking about uh, division. He's talking about this is the time to come together. But I think you and I both know there are a lot of Americans that are not hearing those words in the same yeah. way. Well, he, right. He says he's right when he says it's time to heal. And it's admirable that he would raise that in that way. Um, I would caution a little bit. I know he says that people are not our enemies. They are Americans. Uh, but there are some people who are the adversaries of poor and low wealth people and black people and moving forward in this country. If, if they are not adversaries, their policies are certainly adversarial to justice and to what we're called to be uh, uh, by our deepest constitutional values. And if their policies are adversarial, then the question is, are they adversarial or just their policies? Now, I, can, I understand what he's saying in the sense that you don't just have to go around saying they're evil and, and, and nobody can work with uh, and, and, and they're beyond um, a change, even though we have to be realistic. Um, there are some people that are totally committed. We know what happened, for instance, when Obama ran for office and won. There were people totally committed. We've watched what has happened in this Senate over, the, over not just Trump, but with the Senate. They're totally uh, committed to an, in an adversarial way to being fair when it comes to Supreme Court justice. We look at a Mitch McConnell. He has refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for over seven years. That's an ad politically adversarial position. He's refused to even let living wages come to the floor, even though we have 62 million Americans working for less than a living wage. And I would say, and as I have talked to people from Appalachia to Alabama, they see that as an adversarial position. They see it as a problem that the people are in fact not acting like quote unquote Americans uh, when it comes to the least of these. And uh, as Dr. King once said, they give um, uh, socialism to the wealthy and then give rugged individualism to the poor and the, and the least of these. And we have to recognize that politics is about fighting for things. It is about recognizing that I don't believe there's this so-called centrist viewpoint. Now, I would also say that to the, the president, because there are some trying to say, well, you need to be a centrist. Well, what is a center? How do you give people, what is the center of establishing justice? You give half the people justice? What is the center of providing for the common defense? You give half the people uh, common defense or promoting the general welfare. So you give half the people the promotion of general welfare. In a sense, that's what we have now. And it leans more toward the greedy. Uh, take, for instance, the first CARES Act. 84% of that money went to corporations and bank. It did not go to the people and the essential workers. And those who voted and forced that are adversarial. Now, I wouldn't call them evil or not. Or I wouldn't say they're beyond transformation. I'm a preacher. I wouldn't say they're, they're, they, they, uh, that um, uh, there isn't the possibility. But right now, we know that they have entrenched uh, attitudes toward those who are being hurt the most before COVID and after COVID. So what I would say to the pre president-elect is you promised some things when you ran, and you promised to fight for some people. And we have seen what um, evil public policy can do over the last four years and how committed some people like Trump and McConnell are. They will do whatever they can with power. People need to see what good people will do with power, what good policy looks like. You said that you wanted $15 an hour. If you do that, that will heal the nation because there's no healing of the soul of the mm. nation that doesn't heal the body of the nation. You said you would expand health care. We need to fight for that in the first 50, not 100 days, first 50. You said that you would make sure essential workers had the sick leave and the unemployment uh, and, the, and the rent forgiveness and mortgage forgiveness. They must see a president now that will fight for that. You said you would deal with systemic racism in terms of voting rights and police reform. That needs to happen in the first 50 to 100 days. People need to see now that there will be a true fighting for all Americans, if you will, all people. You said immigration reform was necessary. We would stop 
caging and losing children. We would properly address Native Americans and make sure that they have what has been promised to them as the original people. You must do that. And I think the president, lastly, must go into the places where people have been so lied to that they think a Democratic president and vice president are against them. Go to the South. Go to Appalachia. Let them know that the current policies we have now are costing us a trillion dollars of, 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 of loss because of child poverty, $2.6 trillion in, in lost wages because of wage gaps. Then turn, flip it over and show them if we expand health care, how many people will be helped, black, brown, indigenous, white. How many people will be lifted if we pass living wages of every race, creed, color, and geogra geography? Let the American people know what the cost of inequality is, as Joseph Stiglitz says. What is it costing us? Mm. And if people see their body, the body of the nation healed, then the soul of the nation will be healed. But it can't just be rhetoric and it can't just be some a uh, spiritual kind of coming together that does not have a fleshy reality, that does not have an embodiment of the establishment of justice. Powerful. My question is, a lot of Americans who voted for Joe Biden were voting against Donald Trump, and they were voting for what they saw as a return to normal. And I know that normality is not something you think we can go back to. But I'd like to hear for those people who do have that uh, as their motivator in this moment, what cuts you think have to be made, what divisions have to be made to wake those folks up? So I think Jesus is pretty clear <laughs> on the human condition. And Jesus was saying of his own ministry, you know, oftentimes people present Jesus as just being a nice guy who just loved people and got killed. No, he was killed because he threatened the empire. Because his love and the kind of love connected to justice that lifted the poor, the least of these, all of those that have been rejected by the Roman power structure, those that Cicero called the dregs of the city, Jesus was around them. Jesus said to Caesar, you're not God. Jesus said to the empire, it is wrong to have uh, also uh, you know, a few people with wealth and the rest living in desperation, or what Jesus called the patokos in Greek, those who've been made poor by economic exploitation. He said that nations would be judged by how he treat the least of these. And that created division. That's what Jesus meant. He said that the gospel or the truth of God creates division. And what he meant by that is there has to be a division from truth and a lie. So when people say, for instance, in America, that we don't have the resources. But when COVID began, we saw two or $3 trillion immediately given to corporations, while people who are on the front lines still have not gotten what they need. There's a division. We can't accept that. There has to be a, a, a cutting asunder of that and exposing it for what it is. Uh, every uh, senator and congressperson, they get free health care. They get the best health care. We have to call that out. How can you get the best free health care with a public option paid for by the people? That's what I mean by a public option. And then you don't want your constituencies to have the same thing. Truth and lies cannot exist together uh, and be okay. And that's what Jesus was saying, that there are times there has to be a division. And the truth of the matter is we just came through an election. What is an election about? It is a division of visions. One pe group presents their vision for the country. Another group presents their vision, and then the people decide. Now, I do think a lot of people voted against Trump, but that's not a small thing. That is major <laughs> to reject Trumpism and to reject all that is connected to uh, and the extremism and the division that has that's gone on because Trump did not create it himself. He is an American, and he was created out of the American reality, at least part of it. And part of that American reality has been an American reality that's always trying to go back to division uh, and trying to live in the divisions and believing that that is the way uh, to have uh, power. And as, as I said, he spoke to an audience, not that he created, but that had been created for some 50 years before he ever ran for office. So, so division is a part of our reality. Even in, in the health, uh, we used to, in, when, in, when I was in the country, my grandmother used to have something called lancing a boil. It meant splitting a boil so the pus could come out in order for healing to take place. 
And in a real sense, we have to do that because in addition to the people that voted against Trump, which is huge, we now know from early returns that 55% of people making less than $60,000 a year, poor and low wealth people, voted against Trump. Um, it, last time, uh, poor and low wealth people voted against Trump. The volume wasn't as high because uh, uh, some 34 million poor and low wealth people didn't vote, but 6 million more voted this time than voted last time. And they didn't vote for normal. They didn't vote just to go back to pre-COVID because pre-COVID was 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 43% of the nation, 66 million white people, 26 million black people, 61% uh, of all black people. Pre-COVID was 87 million people without health care or underinsured. Pre-COVID was 62 million people working for less than a living wage. Pre-COVID was 4 million people getting up every morning who could buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. Pre-COVID was 54 cents of every discretionary dollar going to the war economy and less than 16 cents of every discretionary dollar going toward healthcare infrastructure and education. Pre-COVID actually uh, preconditioned us in some ways to be more, be harmed by the pandemic. Most, most, um, uh, public health officials will tell you that in addition to the terrible and almost criminal-like inept response to the pandemic of the Trump administration, in addition to that, it was the fissures of poverty and systemic racism that has given the, the opening for this pandemic mm. to be even worse than it could have been. The majority of the people that are dying, Steve, and I close here, are, are poor and low wealth people. The majority of the people being hurt are poor and low wealth people who did not have the wages prior to COVID and the health care prior to COVID and the sick leave and the unemployment prior to COVID. So large numbers of people, if they voted against Trump, they also were not voting to stay where we are, I believe. And a large people were also, a large number were voting for us not to return to normal because normal was not good. Normal right. was not good. This moment of pain gives us a chance to address what the bad normal was so that hopefully we can move to some new possibilities in this nation. Why has the Republican Party been able to have such almost a monopoly on evangelical Christians? That's a long conversation, Steve. <laughs> and it traces Can you give all us the, the executive back. highlights? <laughs> okay, let me give you the executive branch. We again, these are not new struggles. You know, we started out in this country saying women couldn't vote and white men who didn't have land couldn't vote and black people couldn't vote and black people with three fifths of a person and, and Native Americans could be exterminated. All of those evils, people found ways to misinterpret and engage in theological malpractice to support what they were doing. You know, I often tell people that economics used to not be a, a, a branch of thinking unto itself. It was a part of moral philosophy. But it's hard to have mm -hmm. economics as a part of moral philosophy and then also have slavery and know that morally speaking, you cannot uh, uh, um, you know, support slavery. Our, our deepest religious values just doesn't do that. But we've had this problem in America with twisting the scriptures, slave master mm -hmm. religion, the religious, the religious uh, people that stood against were paid by corporations to stand against the New Deal and call Franklin Delano Roosevelt a socialist. The religionists who undergirded the Klan, the religionists who right. stood against Dr. King. And when I say, Steve, religionists, notice I'm not saying Christian. And even mm -hmm. this term of evangelicals, the way the media talks about evangelicals, like I'm an evangelical, but I wouldn't be counted. Because the way the media often talks about evangelicals, they talk about white evangelicalism, which is really a more of an emphasis on white than evangelicalism. So here's what the problem is. It's just like the Constitution. A lot of people will say they have a religious perspective, but they haven't read, they can't line it up with scripture. They can't line it up with the teachings of Jesus or the teaching of the prophet. They are right when it is a religious perspective, but it's their religion. It's not the religion of Christianity is not the religion of Judaism. And just like when they say they have a constitutional mm -hmm. position, but when you read the constitution, it doesn't sound anything like what they're talking about. So we have a lot of people, and I have to say this as a trained theologian, perpetrating a fraud, engaging in mm -hmm. modern day heresy, 
And that's why more and more people are coming out. We're actually putting out a 14-point plan, first 50, 100 days, rooted in our deepest religious traditions and our deepest constitutional traditions this week for the Biden administration to say, here are things that have to be done if we're going to be constitutionally consistent, morally uh, uh, defensible, and economically sane. What would be a red line disappointment for you in the incoming administration that they could get this wrong and not take the enlightened path that you're encouraging them to? Well, it sounds like, Steve, you have, re you have read the post-1963 Martin, and I'm so glad you have, because some people think all he said was, I have a dream, which is the closing of the speech at the March on Washington. It wasn't even the title of the speech. The title of the speech was Normalcy Never Again. Normalcy Never Again. That's why one of the agenda items of the March on Washington was $2 an hour living wage, which today would be 15 And then, of course, you know the Voting Rights Act. And then, you know, Dr. King said we have to deal with three issues, system uh, poverty, racism, and, and uh, uh, militarism. And it wasn't just Dr. King. It was the welfare rights workers, the women who pushed him to do the Poor People's Campaign. So what he said then is just as true now. And it's what Jesus was saying about, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. The worst thing the Biden administration or any administration could do, I believe, is to settle on what the Pope called recently in his encyclical, the magic formulas of neoliberalism and trickle-down economics, which don't work because it, they don't lift from the bottom. And centrism doesn't do it. And moderate, I agree with him. Uh, those, Dr. King, those that are now talking about, now that we've won, We've got to find some centrist way. We can't really push for health care for all. We may have to slow down on $15 an hour. Well, for black people, it took us from zero to 400 years to get to 725. Mm -hmm. We started out making nothing in slavery. Now 725. We'd have to wait another 400 years to get to 15 at that rate. That just doesn't make sense. What we need to do now is take the Constitution of these United States that says the first goal of a government is to establish justice. And the second is then a, a domestic tranquility. In other words, you can't get to domestic tranquility without beginning with the establishment of justice. And mm -hmm. every policy ought to be examined under the lens of the Constitution. Does this policy establish justice? Not is it left, not is it right, not is it centrist, right. but does it establish justice for those who are hurting the most and they're hurting not because they're immoral, but because of the failure of public policy over and over and over and over again. If we don't do this, even the Fed chairman recently said, we're not going to get the economy back that we had. We know that Wall Street doesn't measure back street and dirt roads and side roads. We cannot exist as a democracy, a genuine democracy, with nearly 50% of the people living in poverty and low wealth. Eight million have been added since May. I would say to President Biden, elect Biden and, and, and Kamala, uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, first thing you do is do exactly what you said. Do not listen to those who tell you to slow down. This is an FDR moment. This is a third reconstruction moment. People are dying. Poor and low wealth people are dying. If you want to heal the nation, heal the body and don't have an agenda of doing it for just a few or just enough that some people can be comfortable with, because those that mm. will only be comfortable with a few, the truth is they would be comfortable with things being as they are. Right. And that is unacceptable. Dr. William J. Barber II, thank you so much for your candor today. And we look forward to seeing what you roll out, the 14 point plan and other plans that you have. Uh, to help uh, give counsel to this new administration coming in. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. And your listeners can go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org or www.breachrepairers.org. So what's the bottom line? It's hard not to be moved by the powerful moral appeals of Reverend Barber. The spotlight is on America now, and the world is watching. Will America come out of this divided and nasty place stronger and fairer? and more just, and restore its place in the world as the so-called beacon on the hill. My guest believes the breach can be and should be healed, 
that people in the richest nation in the world shouldn't have to struggle to make ends meet. But that has been a long struggle and it's ongoing. The election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is one opportunity to begin to move on a new course. But let's face it, American history is also full of opportunities that were never taken. And that's the bottom line.